A lot of nervous people around with the preliminary finals. We thought we'd talk to the man that's been there that many times. He might be able to put your mind at ease. He's got a very big commitment himself in another field, which is uh, having huge success. That man, of course, is Dennis Pagan, played in a prelim um, as a North player and then coached in seven consecutive preliminary finals. If you don't mind, he's been good enough to take our call. Dennis, good morning. Good morning, guys. How are you going? We're going well. Our minds are obviously turning to the footy tonight, and uh, I always think about this great North Melbourne team that you had seven in a row. Have you got anything for the competing teams? If their players are listening at the moment, might just settle the nerves? Just live in the moment. Forget about what's going to happen next week, and uh, just keep your fingers crossed. They, they are reckon they're tougher to win than, uh, than grand finals. Why do you think? Why, why do you think that, Dennis? Do you think it's the anxiety and the tension around it creates sort of this whole other layer that you have to deal with? Is that is that what you think it is? Well, yeah. well I, th- I suppose, Tim, you're, you're so close, but when you boil it all down, you're so far away. Um, and you know, you you can play it over in your mind. You get this time, you get to this uh, pointy end of the season. Um, the games you have with yourself and your thoughts and. You know, if you can, if you can just stay in the moment, yeah. with your uh, uh, whatever your situation you're in, you have got a much better chance. But it's very hard for young men with time on their hands not to think about the last Saturday. Which did you prefer when you had the rest and the bye going into that prelim final, or when you played week after week? Oh, you're better off playing week after week, I reckon. But and if you do uh, happen to have the rest, and some, I reckon some sides have probably <coughs> lost it because their players have got in front of themselves mentally and thinking about grand finals when you haven't even uh, um, beaten, um, uh, you know, the, the side you're playing in the preliminary final. I think back to 99 and uh, um, Essendon were the best side in the competition that year. But obviously um, the Bombers uh, were thinking about grand finals got beaten by a point. Uh, you know, and, and you're going to look back a couple of years ago, Richmond should have won one. And if they had played that preliminary final again 10 times, they'd probably win nine out of 10. But they didn't. The, the the best side doesn't win. The best side on the day wins, and it's as simple as that. Do you think that um, Geelong, having been there, a bit like your side, has been there for a long time under Chris Scott, has a, an advantage coming in against the Demon side that haven't had that many appearances at all? Well, I've probably thought about that for the last three or four times they've played in the finals and things haven't gone to plan for the Cats. Um, I, I, I just, I'll be just be curious to know what the demons actually did, Gary. You know, in the time they've had off, they're they're in the camp, they're together. It's so easy to fall into holiday mode. I hope uh, Simon Goodwin did some competitive work if I was a demon supporter. And you know, I reckon the best line a coach can say after uh, you know you've had a week's off, look, bring the mouth guards Monday, boys. We haven't finalised this team yet, <laughs> and, uh, and still a bit of. Uh, doubt into the player's mind and keep them on edge a bit because if you start thinking about the week after and you haven't even completed the mission in front of you, you'll fall flat on your face. Nothing surer. Yeah, spot on. I'm sure that's the case. Um, which of those, you had a 3-4 win-loss record. Is the, the the prelim, the 94 prelim, the one that hurt the most? Yeah, it was. You know, I think, um, you know, I thought we were... Uh, um, we would have, we would have made a good fist of things in the grand final, I believe. But you know, I, just, I looked looked at that game the other day, and just you pick out incidents in the last five or ten minutes. If if Glenn Archer had gone short instead of going long, and if so and so had a kick wider, um, if you uh, if you only had whiskers, you'd be your uncle. There's so many things that could uh, you would like to change. But anyway, it is what it is, and you just got to move on. I know all the players. Would say those that were coached by you that uh, you had an unbelievable ability to come in after a game and uh, just recall all parts of the game, like with great clarity and with great detail. When you look back at these preliminary finals, do you actually remember them in in detail, or are they a bit of a blur now to you? You know, Tim, I'm struggling to uh, find out where I live these days. I can't think back. To, <laughs> think back to uh, preliminary finals. No, I don't. I don't think about it much now. You, uh, you know. In your time, yeah. that's, you're totally obsessed with it, and you're, uh, that's all you thought of. From the moment you wake wake up to the, the every player on the list, what they're doing, and you, you tried to be as uh, broader in your thoughts as you possibly could. And when, when you're not involved, mm. and you sort of move on, you go to another area. Um, I'm nutty about horse racing now, and that's just the way it is. Now we'll talk about that in a minute. If I was to say to you the '96 prelim final though against Brisbane, what do you remember about that? I'll be quite frank with you, uh, um, Tim, not too much. I remember uh, 
uh, the the next one against Brisbane, I think, when Jason McCartney uh, um, whacked uh, Clark Keating and uh, um, uh, got suspended and didn't play in the grand final. Um, yeah, um, gee, 1996, 25 years ago. Um, yeah, it's a long while ago. Uh, you probably you, you you just have fleeting moments, or someone might uh, uh, speak to you about something, and all of a sudden it floods back, or you see a bit of footage on TV, and you think, oh, yeah, I remember that now, and yeah, that was interesting, and uh, uh, funny game. And see, look, when you're out of it, you know, you probably don't think about it anywhere near as much, and yeah. sometimes I, I think to myself, was I ever involved? <laughs> <laughs> what if I said to you that North led by 32 points a quarter time that day, this is back in 96, and uh, Wayne Carey had 24 touches, 14 marks, and three goals. Are you going to tell me that Carey had a quiet day that day? We didn't have too many quiet days, and I probably I probably took those things for granted a little bit. I was very lucky, very privileged to coach Wayne, and uh, we had a wonderful team, and a, a, more importantly, a great group of uh, individuals, all even, all wanted to have a go, and terrific backup staff, and that's just absolutely critical. And you know, when you got that, and it all sort of joins together and jumps in the melting pot at one one time, and the stars align, you give yourself some sort of chance. And it's only when you look back on it, you think, geez, how lucky we were to have this bloke as a trainer or that bloke yeah. as a um, doctor. You know, when you think of all those things and you think, gee, these players were good. You know, when you think of blokes who come from other clubs and played important roles like Peter Bell and, you know, Robert Scott, Johnny Blakey, these sorts of guys. And you think, gee, you know, you could, you, sometimes you, you draft those blokes and they don't, uh, don't get better. But we were lucky to get blokes in the 90s who were good players at their club, got even better when they came to North Melbourne. I'm going to ask you in a minute about your horse, Johnny Get Angry, uh, in the Maccabi Diva Stakes, but just a quick one. Which, was it the prelim where you gave both Schwatter and Arch a bit of a cook on the way off because they'd missed the game? Which one was that? Um, I think it might have been against uh, St Kilda. Um, uh, uh, Arch and uh, Schwatter got reported for the most frivolous uh, uh, things you'd ever want to see. And it's been very well uh, documented. I said to the boys, Archie's too smart. Both were standing on the gate as, as, the, as the sign went and they come off the ground. And, and for the life of me, uh, how, how silly was Swatter to say there? The first place I see, I see Swatter staring out of the ground and Arch running up the race. And as soon as I got there, I don't know why I said this, I said, you, there was a describing adjective uh, word, you uh, cost us Swatter. <laughs> and uh, looked like I uh, blew the top of his head off, and uh, um, wasn't a bad rocket anyway. I don't know why I said it. You say silly things nah, sometimes, Gary. Uh, yeah, it's hey, a great, hey, Dennis. Great story. You, you, you want to? Well, you know, you know what I think about you as a coach. I think you're one of the better and greater coaches that we've had, particularly in the last fifty years. And I just wonder if you were sitting down. And I know you've been at Carlton too. I'm not going to ask you about your time at Carlton, but if you were sitting down and you were actually interviewing a prospective coach. What are, what, are, what are the questions that you would like to ask that per- person sitting alongside you, off, opposite you? Tim, we make so much about the coach and the Carlton situation is not about just the coach. It's about the board. It's about the administration. It's about the executive. And uh, it's about the past players. I reckon the best thing Carlton could do, um, get all those uh, stakeholders in, give them a chance to say what they think, put it on the, put it on the whiteboard, give everyone a chance to vote on it, um, and, and come up with some key result areas, then say, everyone shut up, we're backing uh, this bloke in, and um, we're going to go for it. There's an amazing story about uh, your old club, uh, uh, Tim, and it, it's always fascinated me. Um, you know, one of the, probably in the late 90s, he said, look, no, you, wouldn't, you retired then. Yep. The players were whinging and moaning about the coach, and everybody, whinge, every, every team that I've been involved with at some stage, as Winston moan about the coach, he's pushing us too hard. He's, he's and players become very sensitive anyway. So I think there was a, a ginger-headed rover who sort of headed the deputation to go and see Roger Hampson. They said we want to have a meeting with Graham McMahon, mm. and uh, it was organised. So they went upstairs to the High Mark restaurant, all the players, and Graham McMahon walked in, and Graham McMahon uh, said to the players, "Good morning, boys. Um, I hear you want to have a chat." But before we start the meeting, anybody who's not happy with the coach, get your bag and go now. Now, boys, what was the meeting about? <laughs> <laughs> no one said anything. And that was the end of it. And you know what? If you get, if you get a, a club 
and the president and the board who are going to make a commitment to the coach. It doesn't matter whether it's Snowy off the tram or Elsa Clarkson. Make a total commitment, and everybody in the club knows that. And if everyone's told if you step out of line, you, you'll be out of the joint that quick you'll think your pants are on fire, um, you've got, you got a chance. And that's Carlton's biggest problem, being united, getting behind the coach and backing him in. The, you know, division, disunity, Chinese whispers, this bloke said you're no good, that bloke's over there, and all the groups whisper in the background. You haven't got a chance. And that's been happening to Carlton during my time. And right up to now, it hasn't changed in 25 years. And with so many intelligent people there, Mm. I just can't for the life of me work it out why they just can't get a simple thing like that and get everyone united. Once you've got that, then start talking about your coach and backing him in. You know, a lot of coaches have been there, good coaches, and failed. Why? Okay, maybe the talent wasn't there. But I can tell you what, having been there, I can tell you it was a snake pit. And I don't know if too much has changed uh, um, in the last 25 years. Absolutely sensational from someone on the inside. I hope that that uh, resonates. Hey, uh, Dennis, before we let you go, so nice to talk to you, as it always is. Uh, Johnny Get Angry was the great story of the uh, racing uh, season last year. He's back. He's in the Maccabi Diva Stakes over 1,600 at Flemington. How's he come up? Well, look, Gary, Johnny Get Angry, um, he, he looks well. He's eaten up. Blood count's terrific. Trialed well at Cranbourne the other day. Everything's uh, um, um, going well for Johnny. He's probably out of his distance range. He mm-hmm. needs it probably, uh, you know, 600 metres further before he gets really hot. And he's up against some uh, really good, really good horses. In you know, he incentivises the, the Queensland horse and Moanga um, and these sorts of horses. Stefani, I just hope he doesn't get uh, wind burn when they go past him. But he'll be trying his hardest. And he'll put his best foot forward, and I, I just hope it's a, a stepping uh, stepping stone to the races that really matter for him. Bigger things ahead for mm. Johnny Get Angry. Absolute delight it was to talk Always. to you this morning, Dennis. Thanks so much for giving us some time. Good on you, Tim. Good on you, Gaz. All the best, boys. See you later. Thanks, Dennis. The great man, Dennis Pagan. What a magnificent synopsis that was. Oh, the that Carlton was Recap. great. <laughs>